Welcome back guys, I am Folygon and this is day 26 of Sculptober. And for today's theme of Extend, I am going to be sculpting a giraffe. But before we get in and talk about the process, click that subscribe button if you're new around here. And if you're interested in downloading anything like my custom brushes, materials, or any of my courses, check out gumroad.com slash Folygon. There's a link down below. So it has been quite a while since the last time I sculpted a giraffe. Uh, I used to sculpt a bunch of animals all the time when I was very new to sculpting. Uh, this is the first giraffe I've ever sculpted. Off the top of my head, I feel like I have sculpted another giraffe recently, uh, within the past couple years or so, uh, but I couldn't find it. This giraffe here is from about six or seven years ago. It was right when I was getting into digital sculpting, so that's actually one of my very first digital sculpts ever. Before that, I didn't have any art background, any art experience, had barely picked up a pencil, let alone a uh, digital pen for like a Wacom tablet or anything like that. So yeah, I was very new back then, but one of the ways that I got introduced to sculpting was through something very similar to what we're doing here for Sculptober. I gave myself a, a little bit of an arbitrary number of 100 days of sculpting. Uh, it started off, I think, I want to say as like a 30 day month long challenge. And then I said, you know, screw it, let's go for 100 and just kept doing it every single day sculpting something new. And they were terrible. They were absolutely horrible. Uh, but it was a really, really big learning experience for me. I learned a ton back then. It helped me progress through a lot of those early awkward stages. And I went from zero to working as a professional digital sculptor in a little under two years. I think it was, I think my goal was to get a full-time job in two years working as a digital sculptor, and it was just a few months short of that. Again, an arbitrary goal of two years, but I think it's nice to have a goal whether you hit that or not. It gives you something to kind of strive for. This time with Sculptober, I know a lot of people are using it as a great way to get in practice, you know, get in the daily work. It's a great way for me to do that as well, but more than anything for me, it's a great way to kind of just remember what it's like to create art just to kind of have fun with it, just to create something new every single day, using it as a reminder that art is not only my job, but you know, also my hobby. I would love to do some more realistic animals in the future as well. I know I'm doing a cartoony giraffe here today for uh, Sculptober. A lot of the stuff that I create is heavily stylized, heavily cartoony. I really like to sculpt uh, cartoony stuff simply because it's stuff that doesn't exist in real life. It's an interpretation of something that might exist in real life or something that doesn't exist at all. I'll also say that there's a little bit of added job security, although that's not why I do it. I just enjoy creating stylized works. But there's been a lot of advances in AI as well as just automated processing for creating more realistic work more easily. And with tools like 3D scanning, a lot of those realistic sculpting processes are becoming more and more automatic. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't a purpose for being a realistic sculptor or that it's bad to do that or a waste of time or anything. I love sculpting realistic stuff. I love just creating interesting 3D forms in general, whether it's realistic or cartoony like what I'm doing right now. But I won't lie, that little bit of added job security is definitely nice. I'll also say that if you are a really good sculptor and you can create some nice forms, uh, you can probably do a little bit of both. So I don't think any digital sculptor, unless you're maybe not very good, is gonna be out of a job anytime soon. But hey, that's why we got things like Sculptober, right? Get in that practice, get in that extra work, have some fun with it. I know that a lot of people that watch my videos don't do any kind of 3D modeling or digital sculpting. I know some of you definitely do. I've seen you guys in the comments. But if you've been hanging out watching a lot of these Sculptober videos and you think that there's no way that you could ever do something like this, I am going to throw a link on screen to a free tutorial and a free piece of software that you guys can download and just get in and get your hands dirty with trying sculpting. I personally recommend if you don't have a graphics tablet, you can get a really cheap one online for, I, I wanna say like 25 to $45 for just something small and simple if you wanna give that a go. But if you just wanna try out the software and play around with it with a mouse, that's totally fine too. Again, there's a link down below for you guys. It's called ZBrush Core Mini. It's the free version of the software that I use. It's very pared down, very simplistic nowhere near as powerful as what I use here, but that is why it has the hefty price tag on it. So get in, give it a shot, let me know if you do. 
I love trying to spread the digital sculpting bug, so if you get in and play around with it, let me know. So we've zoomed past a lot of the process here for this guy. He's super simple. He was just kind of a fun, quick little guy for today. This guy was super simple. He only took an hour and a half to complete. So there wasn't really much to say uh, other than, you know, what I've talked about for most of the other Sculptober videos. But I'd like to talk about some of the process here at the end for some of the polishing stages, some of the posing, and some of the fun things that I get to do to the character's neck to create some more interesting forms there. So I pretty much keep the head symmetrical, but as you can see with the neck, I've started to add these really hard bends in the shape. That was more so for fun than anything else to create some interesting shapes in the silhouette and try to create something a little bit more visually interesting than a pair of parallel lines in the silhouette. I'll talk more about the neck in just a moment, but in terms of painting on this guy, I've been wanting to talk more about painting in a future Sculptober video. I know we only have a few left here, or a little more than a few, but uh, I would like to talk about painting more in the future. This guy doesn't have a ton going on in terms of paint, but for the process here, I start with a simple, you know, that basic off yellow desaturated color and start playing around with the value, hue, and saturation to try to find something that feels a little bit more visually interesting. I didn't want to do some kind of standard super saturated yellow. I'd like to be a bit more interesting with my colors if I can. So you can see here that I start with this super dark color for the spots. I guess they're spots for the giraffe. They're not really round. I'm not sure if spots have to be round though. Either way, uh, I start with a really dark color for those and then go back through and start adjusting them to find a color that I like a little bit more. So painting is definitely a little bit of a back and forth process, even on something super simple like this giraffe. Then down to the neck, I play around with cleaning up the geometry here and add in a few slices. Anytime you can do that to a piece of geometry like this, it's very helpful to get some cleaner, uh, cleaner bends, cleaner angles around those sharp turns. As you can see, there's these different colors or segments separating those uh, sections of the neck. Those are called polygroups, and I use a remeshing tool in ZBrush called ZRemesher to specifically force the geometry, even though it's an automated tool, you can have a little bit more control over it with stuff like this, but I force it to give me what's called an edge loop around those areas. So this kind of stuff is really important for animation because you can get forms to deform in a specific way. For me though, I'm not animating this, but I'm sculpting on it, and I want the flow of my edges and the flow of my polygons to go in a specific direction to better help my polygons or my form uh, already be heading in that direction so that when I sculpt on it, it's a little bit easier to deform in the way that I need it. Talking about the neck a little bit more around those tight creases, I am creating what is called a half lock fold. If you are wearing a long sleeve shirt or maybe a pair of pants right now, hopefully you guys are wearing pants, but maybe not all of you, uh, you can bend your arm or your leg and in the crease of that section, you will see a very similar fold or shape to what I've created around the creases of this giraffe's neck. Now, obviously the neck doesn't bend like this and you would not normally see a shape or crease like that in the form around a giraffe's neck. So I'm taking some liberties with the anatomy here, but it just creates something really visually interesting and helps to draw attention and focus to those areas. And then I head through with my mask lasso and my mask pen to begin creating some more spots cascading down the giraffe's neck. These are super simple. I pretty much just sketch in a basic shape, uh, something like a cube or a trapezoid or an awkwardly shaped pentagon, and go through and adjust as many of those as I possibly can to create a little bit more asymmetry and visual interest. Now I'm just going to be rendering this from the front view, so I don't care too much, but I like to, at least for these daily sketches, create a little bit of asymmetry when I can, so I go through and create a little more variety for that. Once I'm finished masking off all those shapes, I can go through and fill those up with paint. When doing any kind of pattern like this, it's very important to avoid repetition. So throughout this process, I grow the shapes as I cascade down the neck, and I use a mask pen a little bit more loosely as I go down. So at first I started a bit more rigid and controlled, and then as I got closer to the bottom, I started to make those bigger and splotchier. Then I went back through and erased part of the masks to refine those shapes even further. A little bit of cleanup here at the end as always, and that's gonna be it for our quick little giraffe here today. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button. 
And if you're interested in downloading things like my brushes, materials, or checking out some of my courses, click the link down below to gumroad.com slash Folygon. Thanks all for watching. I can't believe we're already done here with day 26. Come on back tomorrow for day 27 with the prompt mischief.